The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Essay 9, Market Efficiency versus Technical Efficiency, Part 2. Unnecessary Obsolescence, Competitive and Planned. When we think of obsolescence, we often might consider the rapid technological changes occurring in the world today. Every few years, it seems our communication and processing devices, namely computer technology, undergo rapid development. Moore's Law, for example, which essentially denotes how processing power doubles every 18 to 24 months, has been extended to apply to other similar technological applications, illuminating the powerful trend of scientific advancement in general. However, when it comes to goods production, two forms of eventual obsolescence occur today which are not based on the natural evolution of technological capacity, but rather result from a. the contrived competitive rule structure of the market system, along with b. the driving urge for market efficiency in seeking turnover and reoccurring profit. <clears throat> the first a. could be called competitive or intrinsic obsolescence. This is obsolescence resulting from the consequential nature of a competitive economy, as each producing entity works to maintain differential advantage over another by reducing expenses in production in order to keep the price competitively low for consumer purchase. This mechanism is traditionally termed cost efficiency, and the result is the products that are relatively inferior the moment they are made. This competitive need permeates every step of production with, in effect, a reduction of technical efficiency along the way via using cheaper materials, means, and designs. Imagine hypothetically if we took into account all of the material requirements for, say, the creation of a car, seeking to maximize its efficiency, durability, and quality in the most strategically optimized way, based on the materials themselves, not the cost of those materials. The life cycle of the car would then be determined only by its natural wear and tear, with a very deliberate design focus on upgrading attributes of the car when they have become obsolete or damaged by natural use circumstances. The result would be a production designed to last, hence reducing waste and invariably increasing e efficacy of utility. It is safe to assume that many in the world today believe this is what actually happens in the design and production of goods, but that simply isn't the reality. It is mathematically impossible for any competing company to produce the strategically best good technically in a market economy as the cost efficiency mechanism guarantees a less than optimal production. The second form, B, of obsolescence is known as planned and this production technique to ensure cyclical consumption gained interest in the early 20th century when industrial development was advancing efficiency at an accelerating rate, producing better goods faster. In fact, there was not only a need to encourage more purchases by the general public, the problem of resulting increased lifespan and general efficiency of goods was also slowing consumption. Again, the more with less phenomenon was surfacing in a rapid way. Rather than allow for a good's lifespan to be determined by its natural capacity, with the logical natural law intention for it to exist as long as possible, given limited resources on a finite planet and a natural interest to save energy, both material and human, corporations decided it was instead best to create their own lifespan for goods, deliberately inhibiting efficiency for the sake of repeat purchases. In the 1930s, some even wanted to make it mandatory for all industries legally, where life cycles were decided not by the natural state of technological ability, but by the mere ongoing need for labor and increased consumption. In fact, the most notable historical example of this period was the Phoebus light bulb cartel of the 1930s, where in a time where light bulbs were able to last up to about 25,000 hours, the cartel forced each company to restrict light bulb life to less than 1,000 hours to assure repeat purchases. 
Today, every major manufacturer strategizes to limit good life cycles based on marketing models for cyclical consumption, and the result is not only the reprehensible waste of finite resources, but a constant waste of human labor and energy as well. Outside the dynamics of the market economy, it is extremely difficult to argue against the need for optimum designs of goods. Sadly, the nature of market efficiency disallows such technical efficiency by default. <coughs> property versus access. The tradition of personal property has become a staple of modern culture with little financial incentive in the long run to utilize a system of sharing or access. While a few examples of community sharing of commodities do exist in the modern day, the general ethic of ownership and the inherent value investment characteristics of property itself make such approaches more costly in the long run by the user than to engage in direct purchase. From the standpoint of market efficiency, this is a good thing, as the more direct purchases of goods, the better. Generally speaking, if 100 people wish to drive a car, Having 100 people purchase those cars is more efficient for the market than if 100 people shared 20 cars in a system of strategically designed access, enabling utilization based on actual use time. If we analyze patterns of actual use of any given good on average, many types of products are found to be used intermittently. Transport vehicles, recreational equipment, project equipment, and various other genre of goods are commonly accessed at relatively distant intervals, making the task of ownership not only somewhat of an inconvenience given the need to store these items, but also clearly inefficient in the context of true economic integrity, which seeks a reduction of waste at all times. Every year, countless books are borrowed virtually for free from libraries around the world and returned not only saving an enormous amount of materials, resources over time, but also facilitating knowledge access to those who might otherwise have no means to obtain it. Yet this practice is a rare exception in the market efficiency driven world today as clearly it is to the disadvantage of the market to have anything available without direct purchase on a per person basis. However, let's hypothetically extend this idea of the sharing of knowledge to the sharing enabled access of material goods. From the standpoint of market efficiency, it would be extremely inhibiting. While profit would still be generated in the capitalist model by the loaning of items to people on the basis of their need, it would be enormously disproportionate when compared to the profit consumption rates of a society based on separate personal ownership of each good. Yet on the other hand, the technical efficiency would be profound not only would fewer resources need to be utilized, along with less labor power, since less of each good would need to be created to meet the use time of citizens, the availability of such goods could very well extend to many who otherwise would not have the ability to afford the purchase to begin with. Only the rental fee, still assuming a market system. In this regard, the technical efficiency has two levels, environmental and social. From the environmental standpoint, a dramatic reduction of resource use from the social standpoint, all things being equal, an increase in the access availability of such goods could also, also occur. So from the standpoint of technical efficiency at the deep expense of market efficiency, a shared access rather than universal property oriented society would be exceptionally more sustainable and beneficial. Of course, such a practice would naturally challenge some deep value identifications common to the property culture today. Competition versus collaboration. The question of society pursuing a competitive or collaborative culture has been a running debate for centuries with assumptions of human nature common to the defense of competition. Today, economists mostly discuss competition as an incentive necessary to continue innovation, along with the generally, impl uh, the generally implied assumption that there simply isn't enough to go around on this planet, and hence everyone has no choice but to fight on some level with inevitable losers. 
Such assumptions noted, the themed context here of market versus technical efficiency shall be explored with respect to the competitive benefits and or consequences. There are two core angles to consider. The first is A, how competition affects industrial production itself. The second is B, how it actually affects innovation or creative development. A, if we examine the layout of industrial production today, we see a complex global system of interaction, moving resources, components, and goods constantly from one location to another for various production or distribution purposes. Business, in its pursuit of profit and cost efficiency, invariably seeks out inexpensive labor, equipment, and facilities at all times to remain competitive in the market. This can take the form of local immigrant labor at minimum wage, a sweatshop production facility overseas, a relatively cheap processing factory across the country, and etc. The bottom line is that from the standpoint of market efficiency, the cost to profit ratio is all that matters. Even if the actual act of this global processing is using disproportionately wasteful amounts of fuel, transport resources, labor power, and the like, the notion of proximal efficiency, meaning in this case the efficiency derived from the distance between industrial production distribution points, is not considered, and the practice of globalization today engages in a vast amount of wasteful resource movement around the world based almost entirely on the interest of saving money, not optimal technical efficiency. This ignoring of the importance of proximal efficiency in industrial action, whether domestic or international, is the source of some very wasteful realities. Today, industrial production is almost entirely international, especially in the techno technological age. The degree to which this is needed from a technical perspective is slight at best. While agricultural production has historically been regional, given the propensity of certain regions to produce certain types of goods, or perhaps facilitate a more conducive environment for other such cultivations, these issues are very few in proportion to the vast majority of industrial goods production, discounting as well various technological possibilities today to overcome such regional requirements. Localization, meaning the deliberate reduction of distance between and around all facets of production and distribution, is the most technically efficient manner for a community to operate. Taking into account the obvious exceptions, such as how, for example, mineral extraction clearly must begin at its point of origin in the earth, it is simple to see, especially with respect to modern technical applications which currently go unused, how the vast majority of life-sustaining goods can be generated in close proximity overall to where they are to be utilized. As will be described in further detail in Part 3 of this text, there is a technically efficient train of thought with respect to the utilization of proximity when it comes to extraction, production, distribution, and recycling waste disposal. The end result would be enormous levels of resource and human energy preservation, preservation of a capacity that, in fact, could be reallocated if need be to further advancing projects, rather than squandered as mere waste via the market model today. As a final note on this subject of how competition limits the technical efficiency of industrial production, increasing waste, the reality of good multiplicity is another issue. While all production by competing companies is typically oriented around historical statistics regarding what their market share is and how many goods they can sell on average per region, the very fact of multiple corporations working in the same genre of good production, producing nearly identical products with only mild variation, only adds to the sources of unnecessary waste. As will be described in the next subsection, the idea of, for example, multiple cell phone companies competing for market share by mere design variation, generating consequentially relative inefficiencies in design due to different strategies to gain cost efficiency, coupled with the general lack of compatibility of components given the financial benefit of pushing proprietary standards and system compatibilities,
creates another complex web of inefficiency. Clearly from the standpoint of technical efficiency, one collective cell phone company working to produce the, the strategically best, most adaptable, universally compatible design would not only be more respectful of the environment, it would also create a tremendous ease and use efficiency as well, since the problem of seeking proprietary repair parts and overcoming compatibility problems would be dramatically reduced. It is often argued, however, that the pursuit of competition and the product variations that arise in the quest for market share by competing businesses is a way to introduce new ideas to the public. However, such a method could also be achieved by systems of direct mass feedback from the public with respect to what is needed, coupled with an emergent awareness campaign about what is now possible given the empirical evolution of technological advancement. B. The second issue here, as noted, has to do with how competition affects innovation or creative development itself. While the assumption still persists today that differential reward for one's contribution motivates other people to seek that reward, which is also a common justification of the existence of classes, modern sociological study finds a number of conflicting views. The idea that humans are motivated inherent, inherently by a need to be others, by, for example, gaining material financial rewards in excess of others, is without credible vindication, outside of the intuitive view drawn from the existing highly competitive, scarcity-driven market condition in which humanity finds itself today by design. <clears throat> <coughs> However, once again, the sociological debate can be set aside as the context here is how competition relates to market and technical efficiency directly. In short, the competitive system seeks secrecy when it comes to business ideas, often universally against the open flow of knowledge. The use of patents and proprietary rights or trade secrets perpetuates not an advance of innovation as many proponents of the competitive market assume, but retardation. It is very interesting to think about what knowledge means, how it is generated, and how odd it is for anyone to rationally claim ownership of an idea or invention. At no time in human history has any singular individual culminated an idea that was not serially generated by many before them. The historical culmination of knowledge is a social process and therefore any claim of ownership of an idea by a person or corporation is intrinsically faulty. The common semi-economic term used today is usufruct, which means the legal right of using and enjoying the fruits or profits of something belonging to another. In reality, however, all attributes of every idea in existence today, in the past and forever in the future, has without exception a distinctly social, not personal, point of origin. It becomes obvious that the notion of intellectual property, meaning ownership of mere thoughts and ideas, has manifest out of the vast period of human history where one's creativity has become tied to one's personal survival. In an economic system where people's ideas have the capacity to generate income for them personally, the idea of such ownership becomes relevant. After all, if you invent something in the modern system which could generate sales and hence help your personal economic survival, it would be extremely inefficient in the market sense of the word to allow that idea to be open source, since others seeking survival themselves would likely quickly seize that invention for their own financial exploitation. It is also easy to see how the phenomenon of ego has manifest around the idea of intellectual ownership as well. Since the basis of reward in such a system invariably has a psychological tie to one's personal sense of self-worth, if a person invents something, files for intellectual ownership, exploits it for profit, and then manifests a large house and extensive property, his or her status as a human being is traditionally elevated as far as the standards set by culture, he or she is considered a success. <clears throat> 
Yet if we were to think about it in general, the sharing of knowledge has no negative recourse outside of the economic premise of ownership for profit exploitation. There is nothing to lose, and indeed an enormous amount to be gained socially by the sharing of information. Coming back to the prior example in this essay of competing cell phone companies, we will notice that within the confines of boardroom meetings, where often marketers, designers, and engineers consider how to improve their product in general, the sharing of their ideas is paramount. However, imagine if that meeting was extended to all competing cell phone companies at once, where not only could they remove their contrived, utility-less marketing angles devised to gain the market share of other competitors, such as aesthetic gimmickry, they could work to produce the cumulative best in concert, extending even more so what if all designs were public domain in the sense that anyone in the world who had an interest to help improve an idea was able to? <coughs> the schematics of a cell phone design could be posted publicly with a system of technical interaction where people from all around the world could help if they had the ability with the technical efficiency and utility of the design. While this is an abstract hypothetical example, it is clear that the result of such an open approach to the sharing of information could facilitate an explosion of creativity and productivity never before witnessed. As will be discussed in Part 3, the removal of the monetary market system is critical to the facilitation of this capacity. <coughs> Labor for income. At the core of the market system is the selling of an individual's labor as a commodity. In many ways, the ability of the market to employ the population has become a measure of its integrity. However, the advent of mechanization or the automation of human labor has become an ever increasing point of interference over time. Historically, the application of machine technology to labor has been seen as an issue of not only social progress, but also economic progress in the market sense, mainly due to the increase in productivity. The basic assumption is that mechanization, or more broadly, technological innovation, facilitates industrial expansion and hence an inevitable reallocation of labor displaced by machine into new emerging sectors. This is a common defense. Historically speaking, there appears to be some truth to this, where the reduction of the human workforce in one sector, such as was with the case with the automation of agriculture in the West, has been overcome to a degree by the advancement of other employment sectors, sectors such as the modern service sector. However, this assumption that technological innovation will generate new forms of employment in tandem with those displaced by it, creating an equilibrium, is actually very difficult to defend when the rate of change of innovation coupled with the cost-saving interests of business is taken into account. As for the latter, the role of mechanization from the standpoint of market efficiency exists almost solely to assist cost efficiency. Robotics in the modern day have far exceeded the physical capacity of the average human being, along with rapidly advancing calculation processes, which continue to vastly exceed human thought. The result is the ability of industry to employ machines, which invariably have more productive capacity than human labor. Coupled with the extremely notable financial incentive of reduced liability for the business owners in many ways. While machines might require maintenance, they do not need health insurance, unemployment insurance, vacations, union protection, and many other attributes common to human employment today. Therefore, in the narrow logic inherent to the pursuit of profit, it is only natural for businesses to seek out mechanization at all times, given its long-term cost benefits and hence market efficiency. As far as the suggestion that equilibrium will always be found eventually between new labor roles and displaced labor due to technological innovation, the problem is that the rate of change of technological development far exceeds the rate of new job creation. This problem is unique as it also assumes that human society would always want new employment roles. It is here where subjective cultural values should be considered.
given that our current sociological condition demands human employment as the backbone of market sustainability, hence market efficiency, the ethic of work, and its identity associations culturally have perpetuated a force where the actual function of the labor role, its true utility, becomes less important than the mere act of labor itself. Just as market efficiency has no consideration for what is actually being bought and sold in general, so long as it keeps cyclical consumption at an acceptable rate, the labor roles taken on today in production are equally as arbitrary in the view of the market. In theory, we could envision a world where people are being paid to do what could be considered pointless occupations. When it comes to utility generating high levels of GDP with virtually no true social contribution, in fact, even today we could step back and ask ourselves what the social role of many institutions really is and perhaps come to the conclusion that they serve only to keep moving money around, not to create or actually contribute anything tangible for the benefit of society. These are complex philosophical questions as they challenge dominant traditional ethics and the very nature of what progress really means in many ways. For instance, the following thought exercise is worth considering. Imagine if we were to revert our social system back to the 16th century, where many modern 21st century technological realities were simply unheard of. The population of that era would naturally have, ex have expectations of what would be technically possible that would be far below what is generally accepted as possible today. If this society was able to superimpose overnight the massive technological capacity of the modern era, there is little doubt that virtually everything related to the core survival of the population could be automated. The question then becomes, what do they now do with their newfound freedom? What becomes the cultural focus of their lives if the basic drudgery of fundamental survival was removed? Do they invent new jobs simply because they can? Do they elevate themselves? preserving and embodying this new freedom by altering their social system itself, removing this previously demanded labor for income requirement. These questions get to the root of what progress and personal social goals and success really are. Nevertheless, a dominant cultural value today is that of earning a living, and the application of mechanization in the sense of market efficiency is actually a double-edged sword. While cost efficiency is inherent to mechanization and hence the general improvement of profit by reducing costs for the business owners, the displacement of human workers known today as technological unemployment actually works against market efficiency to the extent that those unemployed workers are now unable to contribute to the needed cyclical consumption that powers the economy since they have lost their purchasing power as consumers. This contradiction within the capitalist model is unique. From the standpoint of market efficiency, mechanization hence poses both a positive and negative outcome in this sense, and when we realize that the rate of technological change will, in all probability, displace people increasingly faster than new sectors of employment can be created, mechanization as an inhibiting factor to capitalism becomes ever more apparent. It is, in total, decreasing market efficiency in this circumstance. However, on the other hand, from the standpoint of technical efficiency, once again we see vast improvement and immense possibilities on many levels. The production capacity enabled by this application clearly shows a powerful increase in efficiency regarding not only the effect of industrial production, but also a general increased efficiency of the goods themselves by extension of the accuracy and integrity inherent in production. Also, an implication of this new level of production efficiency is that meeting the needs of the global population was never more possible. It is easy to see that without the interference of market logic on this new technical capacity, which invariably inhibits its full potential, what could be relatively deemed an abundance of most life-sustaining goods could be facilitated for the global population. <clears throat> Scarcity versus abundance. 
Supply and demand is a common market relationship which expresses in part how the value of a resource or good is proportional to how much of it is in existence or accessible. For example, diamonds are considered quantitatively more rare and hence of higher value than water, which can be found in a general abundance on the planet. <clears throat> Likewise, certain human creations, if created in short supply, are also subject to this dynamic, even if the perception of rarity is culturally subjective, such as with a single canvas painting by a renowned artist which might fetch many, many times its actual resource value in a sale. From the standpoint of market efficiency, general scarcity is a good thing overall, while extreme scarcity is indeed destabilizing both for an industry or an economy as a whole, shortages, the most optimized state within which the market system can exist is in a sort of balanced scarcity pressure. Hence the assurance of sales producing demand. Again, the life requirements of humans are not recognized in this equation. Meeting human needs in the form of food, housing, low stress circumstances for mental health, and etc. is utterly external here and has no direct relationship to market efficiency. Meeting human needs in a direct sense would again be inefficient to the market's logic as it would remove the scarcity pressure that fuels cyclical consumption. Put another way, there is a need for imbalance in order to fuel this demand pressure and this imbalance can come in many forms. Debt, for example, is a form of imposed scarcity, which puts a person in a position to which they must often submit to labor, which may be of a more exploitative nature, meaning the reward, usually the wage, is grossly disproportionate to what is needed to keep a healthy standard of living in one's circumstance. In this respect, the debt system facilitates a distinct form of market efficiency as it benefits the employer since the ease of lowering wage rates, cost efficiency, naturally increases as private debt levels increase. <clears throat> the more in debt people are, the more likely they will submit to low wage labor and hence generate more profit for the business owners. In fact, the same logic can be applied to the use of legally unregulated sweatshop labor in the third world which is frequently exploited by Western companies. Excessive work hours coupled with notoriously low wages are common, yet these people have literally no choice but to submit as there are no other options for survival in their region, often due to debt resulting from austerity measures. In fact, the regulation of the money supply in total is based on a general scarcity, since as noted before, all money today is made out of debt, and this debt money is sold into the market as a commodity through loans, with the markup of interest attached to generate a profit for the banks. Yet this interest profit, which is money itself, is not created in the money supply itself. For instance, if an individual takes out a loan for $100 and pays 5% interest on the loan, that individual is required to pay back $105. But in an economy where all money comes into existence through loans, which is the reality, only the principal exists in the money supply, with the interest income uncreated. Therefore, there is always more debt in existence than there is money to pay for it. Furthermore, since the poor are responsible for taking more loans in general for their home, cars, etc., than the wealthy who maintain a financial surplus, this overall debt pressure tends to fall on the lower classes compounding the inherently insurmountable problem of being in debt and hence with limited options. In this model, bankruptcy, for example, is not a result of some poor business judgments. It is an inevitable consequence, like a game of musical chairs. So coming back to the central point, the reality of scarcity in the current economic system is a source of great efficiency in the market sense for if people had their basic needs met, or if they were able to meet those needs without the external pressure of irresolv irresolvable debt, which keeps the imbalances, cyclical consumption, profit, and growth would suffer. As insidious as it may seem to our intuition and humanity, that keeping people deprived is actually a positive precondition for the workings of the market. This is the reality. 
needless to say, from the standpoint of technical efficiency. Seeing the human being as a biochemical machine in universal need of basic nutrition, stability, and other psychosocial requirements, which, if unattained, can result in sickness both physical and psychological, we can recognize the decoupled state of human social well-being with this market logic. As a final point on this issue, the market seeks the servicing of problems at all times. In fact, it could be stated generally that technical inefficiency is the driver of market efficiency. Problem resolution is not sought by the market as it then creates an income void and hence a loss of monetary gain and movement. The result of this, in part, is a perverse reinforcement of incentive to seek or even advance problems in general. A century ago, the idea of selling bottled water would have been strange given its general unpolluted abundance. In the modern day, it is a multi-million dollar industry annually derived mostly from the water pollution that has occurred due to irresponsible industrial practices. The profit and jobs now associated with this technically inefficient reality of resource pollution and destruction has improved once again the economic market efficiency needed to keep cyclical consumption going. Conclusion Market efficiency, generally speaking, takes on a macro and micro reality. On the macro scale, anything that can increase sales, growth, or consumption, regardless of the originating pressure for demand or what is actually being bought and sold, is deemed efficient in this context. On the micro scale, this efficiency takes the form of enabling conditions that can increase profit and reduce input costs, cost efficiency, on the part of the business. This efficiency inherent to capitalism operates without any respect for the social or environmental costs of its process to keep cyclical consumption and profit going, and the world you see around you, full of ecological disorder, human deprivation, and general social and environmental instability, has been the result. On the other hand, technical efficiency, which one could characterize as, in fact, a hindrance to market efficiency, seeks to maintain the environment, maintain human health, and essentially keep balance in the natural world. The reduction of waste, resolution of problems, and the maintaining of alignment with natural law is the common sense logic embodied. It is unfortunate to realize that today we have two opposed systems of economy working at once, working against each other, in fact. The market system, embodying its archaic, traditionalized logic, is utterly out of sync with the natural, technical economy as it exists. The result is vast discord and imbalance with ever mutating problems and consequences for the human species. It is clear which system will win in this battle. Nature will persist with its natural rules regardless of how much we theorize this or that validation of the way we have traditionally organized ourselves on this planet. Nature doesn't care about our vast monetary economic ideas its theories of value, sophisticated financial models, or detailed equations regarding how we think human behavior manifests and why. The technical reality is simple. Learn, adapt, and align to the governing laws of nature or suffer the consequences. It is absurd to think that the human species, given its evolution within the same natural laws to which our economic practice and values must align, would be incompatible with such laws it is merely an issue of maturity and awareness today. As a final point, as well as a general aside, there has emerged a trend in the 21st century in the wake of all the growing and persisting ecological problems that claims to seek what is called a green economy. Some have even divided this economic view into sectors, including applications for renewable energy, eco-buildings, clean transportation, and other categories of focus, it will be noticed that all of those awarenesses and sought applications are generally in line with the technical or scientific awareness perspective discussed in this essay. Sadly, as positive as the intent of these new organizations and business planners may be, 
the inefficiency inherent to the capitalist model of economics with all its need for certain forms of contrived efficiency to maintain itself immediately pollutes and deeply limits all such attempts, which explains why such technical efficiency approaches have still yet to really be applied. The sad reality is that while some improvement can be made, such progress will be inherently limited to an ever-increasing degree since, as described, the very structural basis of the way market capitalism works is actively opposed to the efficiencies inherent in the natural law view. The only logical solution is to rethink the entire structure if any real efficiency, elevated prosperity, and problem resolution is to be achieved in the long run.